Hi everyone, welcome back to these processes from the project management body of knowledge. This one in particular is collecting requirements. Now, collecting requirements, we've been through the initiating of the project charter, we've identi identified the stakeholders, and now we're planning our project. And we've, uh, we've put together the bones of our project management plan, and we're starting to gather those, the scope and the deliverables that we'll need to do as part of our project. And part of that, the initial part, is collecting the requirements from our customer and, uh, and our stakeholders. So what do, we what do they actually want us to deliver in the first place? So collecting requirements is the process of determining, documenting, and managing stakeholder needs and requirements to meet the project objectives. And we do it because this process provides the basis for defining the product scope and the project scope. So what are the products and features that we'll be delivering? And the project, what, is the, what does the project have to do? Is it part of the activities? Um, what is the cost going to be? How long is it going to take? The schedule, all of this uh, will come out of whatever it is we actually need to deliver as part of this project. So the project success is directly influenced by active stakeholder involvement. You'll need really active stakeholders to get the best and gather those requirements from them. It's part of the discovery and decomposition, so breaking it down, of their needs into the project and product requirements. Requirements include conditions or capabilities that are required as part of those project deliverables. So what do they actually need to do? These requirements need to be elicited, so gathered, analyzed and recorded in enough detail to be included, included in the scope baseline and in order to be measured. So how do we know that something is actually finished or complete to their specification? Requirements also become the foundation of the work breakdown structure where we have a feature that we're delivering and now we're breaking that down and decomposing it into smaller activities or smaller pieces, smaller deliverables that teams can actually take and work on. Maybe this team can work on all of those, maybe this team can work on all of these. So that's how we're breaking it down and the cost schedule, quality planning and procurement are all based on these initial requirements. So inputs, tools and techniques and outputs for collecting requirements. We've got the project charter, our initial high level view. The project management plan, of course, any part of the project management plan that has requirements and scope to do with it. Project documents that, we've, uh, that we need to update, lessons learned, stakeholders, assumptions that we've made. Business documents along the way, the initial business case has all of those initial requirements as well. So that's an input into our requirements collection process. Any agreements that have been made and EEFs and OPAs. Tools and techniques that we'll be using are expert judgment, again, from all the people involved that we need to gather those requirements from. Data gathering techniques, brainstorming, interviews, focus groups, and then we need to analyze it. So data analysis and decision making once we've analyzed all of that information. Uh, data representation, so we need to show it to executives and maybe to the project sponsor and stakeholders. Here is all of the things that we've gathered, you know, make a decision on which ones are the most important. We need to represent that data in charts and in nice ways. Interpersonal and team skills, of course, we'll need uh, team and communication skills to be gathering that information. Context diagrams and prototypes where we're building a small model before we build the actual complete thing so that's a small cost over here and people can still get an idea for what it's going to look like. And the outputs of this process are requirements documentation. So we've, uh, we're putting all those requirements all together so that people can see. And of course the requirements traceability matrix where we've got the requirements and they are matched to the deliverables so that our, uh, our customers and our stakeholders can see clearly how we're meeting the requirements that they outlined. Now collecting requirements has an uh, input into all of the project documents that you'll see come across in the future. And of course project management plan, the charter, project documents, business documents all have an input into the collect requirements process. So let's have a look at the inputs in a little bit more detail. The project charter has those high level project descriptions and high level requirements that we initially outlined when we initiated the project. And that'll be used to develop the more detailed requirements. The project management plan, uh, these uh, components can include the scope management plan. So how are we going about the process 
of gathering these requirements, that's outlined in how we manage the scope. And the requirements management plan, again, how are we managing the requirements? How are we gathering those requirements? Who's involved? What are the techniques that we'll be using? What are the timelines involved? And stakeholder engagement plan. So what is the process of us to actually engage stakeholders? Is it formal? Is it informal? Do we have working group meetings? Do we have daily stand-ups? Do we have a weekly report? All of these things are very important and it's good to know the process that we need to go through. Other inputs are project documents, any lessons learned, stakeholder register that we can see the stakeholders for our project and any assumptions that have been made. And of course, the business case as part of our business documents, that has the initial feasibility study. So what was the benefit that was outlined from all of these require the high level requirements that we initially outlined and of course, what was the cost? So what was the, what was the cost benefit analysis for that? Is it actually worthwhile? Other inputs are agreements. So project requirements uh, that have been agreed upon previously and product requirements that will, be that will be agreed on as well. And enterprise environmental factors. So what's the organization's culture that we're working with? Uh, do they need formal methods for doing all of these things? Or can you have side conversations? Can you have you know, a handshake agreement or does it need to be signed off by a project management office, project sponsor or an executive within the organization? What's the infrastructure that we're dealing with? What are the systems and the tools? Uh, you know, is it email or is it you know, a, a system like JIRA or Microsoft Project? And personnel administration and marketplace conditions will also affect collecting requirements. Organizational process assets. So any existing policies and procedures for gathering requirements and any historical information from the lessons learned repository that should come into your project as well. Tools and techniques that we'll use as part of collecting requirements are expert judgment. As always, expertise should be considered from individuals or groups with specialized knowledge and training in the following topics. Business analysis, so our business analysts will help us gather these requirements. Very, very prominent role in projects these days and you'll find yourself working with business analysts a lot. Requirements elicitation, so anyone who's an expert in gathering that, uh, w doing those workshops or gathering that information. Requirements analysis, requirements documentation. Uh, project requirements from previous similar projects, so maybe they can help us out. Diagramming techniques, facilitation and conflict management. So there may be special people who can help you know, with, with bringing certain groups of people together if they don't get along, and certainly that can happen. Uh, if there are competing things in an organization or even across organizations. Data gathering is also important. So as part of gathering that information, we may need to brainstorm with a group of people. So we've got a big group of people and you'll need to facilitate that, uh, that, that meeting and really elicit that information from a large group of people. And you can do that through one-on-one -on -one interviews as well. Focus groups where you're using a particular item, like maybe a web page, and watching how people use and interact with it and gathering their feedback from there. Questionnaires and surveys out to a large group of people, gathering information from questionnaires. And of course, benchmarking, where we're comparing two different uh, organizations for similar ideas. So maybe it's a particular process, but one is uh, you know, a drinks company and one is a, uh, you know, a light bulb company, for example, um, and that's a terrible light bulb, but you get the idea. They're, they're not necessarily competing organizations, so you can compare similar you know, processes or similar lessons across those organizations without the need for them to be competitive. We'll need to analyze that data as well. So document analysis is used to elicit requirements by analyzing existing documentation and identifying information relevant to the requirements. So documents that might be analyzed are business plans, business rules, processes, current process flows, uh, any marketing li literature, problem or issue logs that are existing, um, use cases, so how is something being used uh, or how have we outlined it being used uh, maybe it's you know, this step, this step, and this step, and that's the person at the, who, you know, the actual customer who's using it, and these are the problems that they're running into. That's all part of your data analysis for collecting the requirements. And of course, we'll need to make decisions along the way where we've got voting, so you may need to vote on requirements, which one is the most important, which one is the least important. 
Unanimity is where we've got 100% of people agreeing. Majority is 50% of people agreeing. And plurality is just the largest block um, as opposed to all of the other blocks. So you might have 30% of people and then 5, 10, you know, 20, but still this is the largest one. That's plurality. Now you will see an, uh, an exam question on voting as well and the differences there. Um, autocratic decision making is where one person just says, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. And you know, that's the decision. And multi-criteria decision analysis is where we have different options up the top and different criteria down the side. And we say this one meets that criteria, this one meets that criteria, and this one meets that criteria. And so this one meets all of it. We're pretty happy to go with that multi-criteria decision. We'll need to represent the data once we've found it. So affinity diagrams, collecting all of the similar ideas, similar ideas over here, similar ideas over here, and grouping them together. Maybe we can put all of these particular ideas into the same feature and deliver it at the same time. So we really need to know what, how are they related? What's their affinity together? That's an affinity diagram. And mind mapping, where we're taking a central theme, maybe it's, uh, it's payments, for example, and what are the other themes that come out of there? So maybe we need credit cards, maybe we need, uh, you know, ease of use. Um, maybe we need it to be web-based and maybe we need it to be telephone-based as well. So what are, the, what are the ideas around that central idea that we need to be aware of? That's mind mapping. Interpersonal and team skills, of course. So very important. Facilitation, as we mentioned, you will need to facilitate meetings to gather those requirements. Nominal group technique is a similar technique to voting, but it's anonymous. So everyone, you've got a few different ideas and everyone anonymously votes or puts their vote in. Everyone can write it down on a piece of paper and then hand it in. The votes are all tallied and by doing it anonymously, then it just means that they're not impacted by the, the larger or the, the more noisy people in the room. So maybe executives have a very you know, forceful opinion uh, or other people have a very forceful opinion. And so by doing anonymous voting, you know, it's, it's, uh, people are less likely to be impacted and you're more likely to get the true representation of the information. A context diagram is where we have a system. So a business system any, any system that you might have, maybe it's a web page, for example, and we, we just show the flows of how, what inputs into that system, and then what outputs out of that system. And that could be for people or information um, or other systems. So maybe we've got you know, the payment system as an input into the, this web page and our customers as an input. And who receives that output from this particular system. That's your context diagram. Prototypes are where we build a smaller version of the final product um, at a lower cost before we build the big final feature. And, and that way we can see whether it works or not or get an idea of what it looks like before uh, we actually spend a lot of money on the final product. Uh, things could be small scale products or computer generated or computer aided drawing, CAD drawings, 2D and 3D models any mock-ups or simulations. Uh, of course, storyboarding is a big one for, for web pages and that sort of thing as well, uh, where you can clearly see if someone clicks, they go to this page. If someone clicks, they go to this page. And you can really just draw it up without actually developing the final thing already. Outputs will have the requirements documentation. So requirements, once we've gathered these requirements, we really need them to be unambiguous, so very clear. They need to be traceable. So how do we know uh, that you know, the requirement matches the deliverable? They need to be complete, consistent, and acceptable to the key stakeholders. So we do need our key stakeholders to say, yes, those are the requirements that we wanted. We need them to sign off on those requirements. Um, and we could have things like business requirements that we're delivering into. Stakeholder requirements, what do they need as part of the project? Project requirements, quality requirements. So what, uh, is it, does it have to be of a high grade? Does it have to be of a high quality? And of course, any transition or readiness requirements back to business as usual. What are those requirements? Do we need training? Do we need communications into that part of the business or organization? Now, one of the main things that you'll see is the requirements traceability matrix. And uh, that basically helps us match our requirements 
to the deliverables. And basically we've got things like the project objectives, product development, test strategy, and it, it'll have an input into test strategy and test scenarios. And those high level requirements will uh, become more detailed requirements as part of the requirements traceability matrix. It'll usually have things like a unique identifier, like a number, um, a description of the requirement, rationale for inclusion, who owns it, where did it come from, the priority, is it high or low, uh, the version, current status, and any other additional attributes like complexity or acceptance criteria that needs to be met for us to actually accept these particular requirements. And here's just a brief example where we've got you know, the identifier there, what are the uh, goals and objectives, what is the work breakdown structure uh, activity deliverable that's associated with that requirement over here, uh, and which test cases have we got to actually test that that is fit for purpose. And that is the detail of the requirements traceability matrix that'll be a key input into other processes as part of your project. And that overall is the collect requirements process in the PMBOK guide.